Westwood is a fashion designer who's always been very attuned to the time. She sort of felt out and noticed what's bubbling under the surface and responded and reacted to it before anyone else. I think Vivian is seen as an eccentric in England, and I think often it's easy to overlook how significant her contribution to culture has been. The reason why what Vivian does and has always done has been interesting is because it's deliberately going against what everyone else is doing. She's constantly searching for something new, for something different. She wants to kind of ruffle people's feathers and do something that, that will upset the status quo. Vivian Westwood was born Vivian Isabel Swire in April 1941 in the village of Tintwistle uh, near Glossop in Derbyshire. A very small town and she had a really rural upbringing. It, actually her family home wasn't in the town proper, it was on the outskirts. So really her upbringing was all about kind of running fields and running free. Her father was a, both a cobbler at one point in his life and also worked for a nearby factory. In 1958, Vivian Westwood moved with her parents and brother to Harrow, London. She stated when she moved to London, she was not a Londoner. So she'd grown up, grown up in this very rural area. She said she hadn't visited an art gallery, hadn't read an art book, hadn't been to the theatre. So it was really interesting change for her to be so close to London, on the outskirts, but much, much more access to all these things. And initially, she had a real path of her life going and rolling. She actually married very young, 21, she had her first child, and she was training to be a teacher. Her first husband, Derek Westwood, they kind of lived together in, in marital bliss for a while, but Vivian's nature was that she became incredibly um, bored very quickly. She wasn't... Um, in her own words, she, she wasn't very interested in being chained to the kitchen sink with a screaming brat around her ankles. She wanted more for herself. She wanted to go out and explore the world. Um, and she was very jealous of her younger brother, Gordon, who was then attending art college in Harrow um, and was mixing with a much more artistic, free-thinking set in the mid-60s. By 1965, she left Derek Westwood and, and petitioned him for divorce. It was in 1965 that she first met uh, Malcolm Edwards, who would later become known as Malcolm McLaren. He was a friend of her brother's. He was a really kind of very full of character. Her brother describes meeting him in the canteen at Harrow Art School and him just sort of t relaying tales and things he knew. Very soon they developed a romantic relationship. And in um, 1967, her second child, um, Joseph Corey, who was named after Malcolm McLaren's uh, maternal grandmother, was born, and obviously he was, uh, he was McLaren's son. At the end of the 1960s, Vivian Westwood moved in with Malcolm McLaren and her young family. They moved into a council flat in Nightingale Lane in Battersea. Vivian was so attached to the place that she stayed there through until the end of the 1990s, after McLaren left and when her company had become an enormous success. Vivian had been attending teacher training college and uh, got a job as a primary school teacher. She was the sole means of support for the young family. She uh, made jewellery and was selling it on Portobello Road. And then as things progressed with McLaren, she started making him suits. At this point, they were very, very um, interested in sort of teddy boy, 1950s nostalgia. And you can see traces of that throughout her work, through her whole career. In 1971, um, there was a, a shop called Paradise Garage at the end of the King's Road at number 430. At Paradise Garage, um, there was a space in the back of the shop, and McLaren and, and Westwood approached the owner and asked if they would be able to, to open a retail space there. Um, they said they, they could, and they founded a shop called Let It Rock. And what they did was um, outfit the entire place in a, a kind of recreation of 1950s um, Britishness. 
the shop in 1972 changed its name and it was called Too Fast to Live, Too Young to Die. In the name change, there was also a shift in the clothing that she was selling, um, moving away from the 1950s tailoring uh, zoot suits to much harder sort of biker jackets, leather. The whole idea is that as um, as the moods change, as the inspiration change behind the, the kind of aesthetics that Vivian and Malcolm were proposing, they would rip the shop apart, rename the shop, redecorate the shop. So 1974, the, the shop went through another change called Sex, and this was very much bondage wear. Uh, rubberware for the office was one of their catchphrases. And then again in 1976, there was, a, there was, there was the, the final name before the one that still stands called Seditionaries. Malcolm said the name came from the need to seduce people into revolt. It's a combination of the word seduction and the word revolution. This was all in line with Malcolm McLaren's new kind of baby, his project, which was the band The Sex Pistols. McLaren had been on a trip to New York and he'd seen an artist perform there called Richard Hell and he'd been absolutely blown away by the style in which he dressed himself. The slits in his, his T-shirt, the DIY aesthetic. And this was something that it's, it's written into history that he was so inspired that he took back to London with him. Seditionaries really was the, seen as kind of a mecca for punk. It was seditionaries that outfitted the Sex Pistols, and it was seditionaries that created that very well-known archetype of punk, which is um, a T-shirt, kind of scrawled with an obscenity, a pair of bondage trousers, um, and very extreme, spiked, multicolored hair. It's something that was sported by a number of different people, um, you know, and could potentially be accessorized with kind of a holy mohair jumper. And really what happened at this point was Vivian kind of becoming a fashion designer. Vivian really redesigning garments, making garments, collaging elements together on them. It, it, it's really at this point that Vivian's kind of discovering her identity and discovering what she can do with clothes and is becoming more and more interested in making clothing from scratch. Vivian herself talks about uh, her career as a fashion designer. She says it began in 1981 with the collection that became known as Pirate. Um, what happened with that collection was that, that Seditionaries was boarded up, Seditionaries was completely reworked and was renamed as World's End. World's End was about looking backwards. It was about a nostalgia. It was, it was about a kind of harking after the romance, specifically of the kind of 17th and 18th century. And what Vivian did at that point, which she said no one had ever done before, was to go and look at the cut of historical clothes. She got the, um, the pattern books of Janet Arnold, which detailed the, the way the 18th century and 17th century clothes were made. Vivian copied those, but then she also reinterpreted them. She twisted that to make it something relevant for the for the 20th century. Westwood looked very much to sort of the East and looked at traditional ethnic dress and was very, very inspired by that. And in this collection uses interesting sort of rectangular pattern pieces, kind of stitching them together to get a shape that's really out of the ordinary. And it, it was really fresh, it felt very new. Again, big change from punk rock, it's, it's, it's always shifting. It was her first formal show on a catwalk. And incidentally, the, the name Pirate never was never included on any of the, the kind of publicity, the invitation, any of the publicity around it. It's the first time that Vivian West was clothes appear in British Vogue. In the very early 80s, there was a big shift to new romanticism and this really, really caught on. And again, Westwood was really attuned and, and, and part of the zeitgeist. So she was moving um, with the tides. You see these kind of very overt, frilly cuffs and that really kind of harks the change and shift in, in terms of how the new romantics went on to dress. Vivian West's work in the early 80s is extraordinary when you look at kind of its, its depth and its richness. It wasn't yet under her own name. The, the label was called World's End and it was credited to both Westwood and McLaren, who'd been her romantic partner but wasn't anymore, but continued to work alongside Westwood through until 1984. 
Looking back at these early collections, what, what's extraordinary about them is it's really Westwood experimenting with clothing. Westwood experimenting with conventions of clothing and challenging notions of, of tailoring, notions of, of putting clothes together in a Western sense. There's lots of references to Oriental cutting, there's lots of references to kimono cutting. In her second catwalk collection, which was Savages, um, it was really exploring these ideas of, of kind of primitive clothing. She talked about kind of um, exploring tribes, looking at, at kind of African clothing, looking at ways that people who didn't know how clothes should be put together would assemble garments. Other collections were, were called names like Hobo Punkature, which referenced back to punk in terms of its distress, but, but equally kind of referenced um, the, the clothes of homeless people. Um, and Westwood was exploring things like stone washing, acid washing. She would kind of wash clothes with, with dyes and with acid until they literally ate through the garments. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Clint Eastwood, the collection was the first without Malcolm McLaren and sort of signaled in a new shift and the clothes shown were very, very bright, interesting tailoring. It's the first time the Clint Eastwood bomber jacket was shown, and that, again, is a new experiment. So she was trying to explore the line that didn't have any of the same curves that a normal jacket would have, so none of the stitching or seams would be in the same place. So it's really quite experimental. What Westwood was doing at that point was influencing the, an entire generation of fashion designers. It was influencing, and it was really establishing London itself as kind of a centre of creativity. So the Mini Crini um, is inspired by Petrushka, which is a ballet uh, originally performed in 1911 by uh, Diaghilev's Belarus. You see the shape is very, very interesting. It's this very kind of rigid, formal crinoline, but very short. But there's also a great amount of historic references there, which she continued to research and um, use within her designs. After all that exploration, after um, this whole idea of, of going out exploring, um, Vivian talked about those early 80s collections as the idea of getting off our island and going and exploring the world. Um, Vivian then became enamoured with Britain. Um, the, the first collection really that, that kind of explored that was Harris Tweed, which was initially kind of stimulated by visiting one of the mills that still made Harris Tweed and by a, a textile salesperson showing her Harris Tweed and Vivian kind of um, falling in love with it for kind of the nostalgic illusions. What Harris Tweed also allowed Vivian to do was to create a collection that explored English tailoring, that explored the notion of Englishness. I mean, Harris Tweed is Scottish, but it's, it's an English sense that she's, she's not using it to make kilts. When Vivian talks about herself, she always refers to herself as English. She doesn't talk about British. She refers to herself as English. And I think there's an incredible Englishness to what she does. The fact that the, the Harris Tweed coats were based on the princess line coats that Elizabeth and Margaret wore was very much this, this reference to kind of English country life and to English royalty. After um, Harris Tweed, Vivian began a series of collections that she called the Pagan Collections. And what those collections were about was exploring um, ideas of kind of ancient Greeks combined with um, the classicism of English tailoring. Um, and she created, a, for instance, a collection called Time Machine, which was a, an homage to the H.G. Wells book. Um, she created a collection called A Voyage to Scythera, um, which drew its, its name from a Fato painting from the 18th century. Vivian Westwood dressed as Margaret Thatcher on the cover of Tatler was something she decided to do because she felt that she had to say something, or she had to stand up and do something about Thatcher, um, who she, she deeply disagreed with politically. And she actually wore a suit that was meant for Margaret Thatcher and made by Aquascutum that Miss Thatcher hadn't picked up. 
So I'm not, I'm not quite sure how Vivian Westwood found this out or Tatler found this out, but they went and picked up the suit. That was what she was dressed in. She absolutely looks amazingly like Margaret Thatcher on this cover. But sadly, the editor was fired the next day when it, when it, when it went out um, because it caused such a storm. There was still this idea with Vivian of, of attacking orthodoxy, of attacking an establishment. Um, and the idea of, of this incredibly um, convincing image of Vivian dressed as Margaret Thatcher, subtitled with This Woman Was Once a Punk, has proved incredibly powerful. So in 1990, Vivian Westwood won uh, Designer of the Year at the British Fashion Council's awards. Portrait in 1991 was um, an amazing collection that was inspired by artwork. Um, she is a really, really keen visitor of museums and gallery, and especially historic portraiture. So inspired by Boucher, she created these works, uh, her, her designs, that took influence from the paintings. The bit I liked best about it was that she had these amazing shoes which were built with a wooden platform that she said looked like the girls were standing on a plinth, that they just stepped out of the uh, painting, the canvas. I think, I think something about that that really kind of um, sums up the attention to detail and the concepts with her were always so fully rounded. They, they were, everything was so considered. Collecting the OBE in 1992 is one of the most interesting sort of historical moments of Westwood's career because obviously she'd been such an enemy of the states uh, at the beginning of her career. And then time and time again, she'd moved and shifted. God Save the Queen, the Sex Pistols, her dressing up as the Queen. She was actually uh, imprisoned or, or, you know, arrested for that. Uh, and then here you have her um, less than 20 years on being celebrated for her contribution. I think it's really quite incredible. Vivian married her second husband, Andreas Krontaler, in 1992. He had previously worked as her assistant. Vivian believes she works best with a, a creative partner, with someone that she can spar with, um, with, with someone who can encourage her um, and, and suggest things that she wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Um, that's the way that she worked with Malcolm McLaren at the early part of her career, and it's the way that she sees herself working with Andreas today. You can see his influence across the collections in the 1990s, which became structurally much more ambitious. And her work in the 1990s, encouraged by Andreas, is exploring the, the kind of grandness of ball gowns. She was really, really, really impressed by his approach to couture fabrics. And I think you can see that in her work. There has been this big shift to uh, doing gold label, and that's something Andreas heads up now. From the end of the 1980s through to the end of the 1990s, what really happened is, is Vivian Westwood's business changed. Vivian Westwood moved from a kind of cottage industry into a fully-fledged company. She established Red Label, which was a lower-priced um, line that could commercially exploit some of the innovation that, that Westwood proposed under the line she then called Gold Label, which she herself dubbed as Demi Couture and was much more difficult to sell, much more difficult to manufacture. Um, it, it was the high-profile catwalk line. She also launched spin-offs such as Perfume. Her fragrances were a kind of venture into becoming more of a kind of fully formed brand, um, having all the things on offer. Her first fragrance, Boudoir, is very floral, um, and then uh, Libertine is, is inspired by the monarchy. Again, you know, her interest in, in the monarchy continues. What Westwood also did in, in 1996 was launch her first menswear collection. She toyed with menswear before. There had been menswear in her collections throughout the 80s, and she presented a, a collection called Cut and Slash at, at Pity in 1990. The launch of Vivian Westwood Mann in 1996 was a project primarily for, for Andreas Krontaler, her, her husband, to explore his interest in menswear. But it did prove popular and it, it certainly appealed to a certain section of men. 
So by 1999, Vivian Westwood has opened a store in New York and also launched a new line of cosmetics, uh, bath products uh, called Coquetry. The Ethical Fashion Collection was an initiative that she worked on with Kenyan workers and the things that were made have been really, really successful. I think she's in her fifth or sixth year working um, with the Ethical Fashion Initiative and I think she's a real dedication to sort of environmental change and so I think obviously working conditions are really, really important to that. She did a Jubilee capsule collection um, that was inspired by gowns that had been worn by Queen Elizabeth throughout her reign um, and her life. It was a series of beautiful dresses that took uh, these inspirations, but then, of course, making them her own. Really what Vivian's interested in now is this idea of, of environmentalism, of ecology. Vivian's really interested in the, the notion of buying less and buying well. Um, a lot of people see that as kind of antithetical to a fashion company, um, but obviously Vivian's argument is that if, if you buy clothes by her, they're, they're made out of better fabric and they're better made than other designers' clothes. Um, so you can buy less as long as you're buying from her. She said that if she had her time over again, she'd like to be an eco-warrior. Really, she has been doing so many projects that focus on uh, fracking. She is very, very against fracking. She criticises the environmental approach of various governments and, and really the, the similarity between what she's doing now and what she did in the past is that she's using her clouds as the billboard. Her career has been so varied and so impressive. I think her legacy's already sort of going. I can only imagine what it might be um, in years to come. Ultimately, the legacy of Vivian Westwood is that after Yves Saint Laurent, she's probably the greatest designer of the late 20th century. And really the interesting and important thing that she, she has done, which no other fashion designer has, has been able to equal, is the fact that she's broken out of the realms of fashion and that she's actually influenced a wider shift in aesthetics, in approaches to design, in approaches to visuals across all different elements. And there isn't another fashion designer that has done that. There isn't another designer who, working in fashion today that has influenced culture outside of the realm of clothing. That's really what Vivian's done. And that's what her legacy will be, that, that she broke free of fashion and help to redefine it.